Go ahead and begin opening your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12 is where we'll be uh, studying this morning. Now I know, as most of you can probably tell just by looking at me, I've never been much of a runner. So you'll probably be even more surprised when I tell you that my two favorite sports, both to watch and to play, are soccer and baseball. Now, as well as most of you probably know, I was a missionary kid born and raised in West Africa, so growing up, I got to play the backyard versions of these games. Everything over there where I grew up is dirt and sand, so whether it was our yard or out in the street, I was always playing soccer. Soccer is a huge thing over there, really one of the only sports they know. Um, I was always playing soccer with our African friends, uh, the local boys who would come over and play with me and my brothers. And it we'd make the court as big as we wanted it or as small as we wanted it. Uh, really, the only boundaries were either lines you drew in the sand with your foot. And the goalpost would usually be everyone's shoes piled in stacks at each end of the, the field. And those were the goalposts. And just try to kick the, get the ball past the goalie and through the, through the shoes. So needless to say, uh, I grew up playing this. And we also taught our friends how to play baseball, which is a totally foreign concept to them. But... They actually really loved it and sometimes asked to play that over soccer. So it was really fun teaching Africans how to play baseball. But again, first base was the corner of the porch. Second base was a stump. Third base was the corner of the storage shed. And home base was a flat stone we used. So we got to make the field as big or small as we wanted. And you play as long as you want. When you get tired, you quit. So I never really got the opportunity to get involved in professional sports of any kind. And so when I got to college at ABC, I loved soccer. And I, one of the reasons I went there is I saw they had a really good soccer program. And so I went my freshman year. Uh, my relatives, who I'd been staying with the previous few weeks, uh, dropped me off two weeks early for soccer preseason training. And those were two of the hardest weeks physically of my life. I just about killed myself. But I stuck with it. I gave it everything I had. We went on an eight-mile run out on the trails of West Virginia, followed by um, a canoeing slash rafting trip on the water, which used your entire upper body. And I was using muscles I never even knew I had before. So needless to say, when we got to uh, coming up to our first game and everything, we actually had more... Um, people there for practicing than they could use on a team, even for subs. So the coach approached me one day and said, I really hate to do this, but we've got too many guys and I have to make some cuts. And he said, I really hate to do this because I can tell you've been giving it everything you have. I know you want this. I know this is something that's really important to you, but I have to take everything into account and you don't have the endurance and stamina that's necessary for a long-term season of soccer. Um, some, there were days of practice I could barely walk back to my dorm because I was, my muscles were so worn out and sore and it just hurt to come back to practice the next day. So I learned a valuable lesson that physical endurance takes effort and practice and a lot of hard work. And I just had not had the opportunity to be involved in the training necessary to condition my body to be ready for that. But I am grateful that the coach, because of my perseverance in the matter, he did uh, compromise with me and allowed me to still be technically considered part of the team. But I was what was known as the team manager. So I got to travel with them to away games, um, do everything with them. I kept stats during all our games. I kept water bottles full. I collected equipment, set equipment up. And I also uh, was in charge of washing jerseys, which was not always the funnest job. but. Because that season, we had so many muddy games in the rain and played on fields that were mud pits. But it was definitely an experience in learning the school's motto, which is life is for service. And that was my initiation into that mindset. So I do thank the Lord for that experience, despite the hardships that came with it. So physical endurance is important, especially if you're wanting to be involved in a job or a sporting activity that requires such. And the same can be said for um, spiritual endurance, as we'll be seeing today. In Hebrews 12, we have the verses that compare the spiritual life to a race. And so we'll be digging into that today. Let's go ahead and read 
together. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Verse 1, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin, and you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. But he, for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that we can know it is true. In uh, an instruction manual and love letter uh, directly from you, Lord, we thank you for the, the authors who you inspired to write this and the full cohesive message of the entire book uh, that you want to impress upon our lives. We pray that as we look into this passage today that you would reach each and every heart uh, here, including my own, with the truth that you want to give us and the things that we can take from this and apply to our own lives. We pray that you would uh, take us from here seeking to apply endurance and perseverance to our lives and our walks with you, that we would submit to your will and authority as we do so. Pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So, I believe it's important to, every time we look at Scripture, know the, know the full context in which we're studying. So, to give a little background context, uh, Hebrews, we don't know exactly who wrote it. Uh, lots of people think it was Paul, but there are some of his characteristic elements that are missing, so some people may think it may have been someone else who remains unnamed. But regardless of who wrote it, it's clear that it, this was written to a specific audience in a specific situation, and it's important for us to understand the similarities and the differences between them and us before we apply this passage. Christ, uh, this book of Hebrews was written to Christians who had been saved out of Judaism. They were being persecuted and pressured to recant their new faith in return to the Jewish law. They were in need of endurance. The writer of Hebrews, again, maybe Paul, but we're not sure, encourages them to press on and endure, knowing that the rewards in Christ will far outweigh the losses in Judaism. Islam in West Africa, by comparison, is very, very similar. Turning to Christ there, even today, means facing persecution from your own family. And there are some very um, important and elevated pastors in our areas that I knew growing up that had attempts made on their life by their own parents and their own siblings because they turned to Christianity. And so there are places in the world today that are still um, facing extreme persecution, but it's pretty obvious, as we'll see, that the audience of Hebrews was not necessarily facing the threat to their physical harm, physical well-being. The closest they came to that was that some of their possessions had been taken away and they'd basically been evicted from their homes, etc., but there was no threat on their life, no threat of torture or um, execution if they did not recant. Because this was from their former Jewish families and friends who were saying, you've turned to the wrong religion. Judaism is still the true uh, word of God. Um, so they were not yet facing physical harm, as we'll see. Now, to look at the textual context where this passage fits in the whole of the book of Hebrews, 
Our passage starts in verse with the word, therefore. And as my father and some teachers at ABC uh, made very clear to me, and something I use a lot, is when you find the word therefore, you should look at why, what it's there for, um, which involves looking at the previous passage. So if we look at chapter 11, specifically verses 33 to 40, chapter 11 is known as the Bible's Hall of Faith, telling of many Old Testament servants of God who persevered and endured through trials because of their faith in the promise of the coming Messiah. These verses, uh, verses 33 to 40, list some of the persecutions and martyrdom suffered for the sake of their faith, and they endured it all. So let's quickly read verses 33 to 40 of chapter 11 to give us some context. Again, talking about uh, Old Testament servants who endured things for their faith looking towards the coming Messiah, who, through faith, subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. And no, that doesn't mean extraterrestrials. It means foreigners. Um, uh, women received their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trial of mockings and scourgings, yes, and of chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. And again, that refers to the promise of God's redemption plan, the coming Messiah. God having provided something better for us, that they should not be made perfect apart from us. In other words, that means that they should not have died and, and, and suffered those things in vain. We have an even bigger opportunity and responsibility, this side of redemption, this side of Christ's suffering, to them to live in a manner that is worthy of the suffering of Christ. Um, and I, I really appreciate the phrase there that says, of whom the world was not worthy. It's, that means that those people were so incredible in their stand for God and their, their faith that no one else fully understood what they were going through and how important this was to them. And the rest of the world was not worthy to have such incredible people um, living in history. So as we look into chapter 12, the very first phrase in verse 1, therefore, we also. So it's obviously following up this list of other people in chapter 11 that has just come before. So verse 1, let's start looking at this passage. Therefore, we also. Following that list of those who suffered and endured before us, we now have the opportunity to practice endurance in our life. We have that much more of a responsibility on this side of redemption. And again, the original audience here was on this side of redemption. They were hearing this straight from the mouths of the apostles who had seen Christ in person and had lived it. This was written during the start of the church. And so there are those similarities, but I think we need to realize that we today, yes, they had a responsibility for those who came before Christ and who lived by faith of the, in the coming Messiah, but we today have yet even greater a responsibility to live in endurance because even since the days of the Bible, since the Bible was completed, you can find countless biographies of missionaries who went overseas, uh, single women, men, families, who went overseas and endured in incredible hardships and persecutions. Some of them never even saw the fruits of their labor. My favorite is David Livingston, one of the first missionaries to the hearts of Africa, and he never saw one convert during his life. It wasn't until a couple years after he died that the people he had been ministering to finally realized what he was standing for and that what he had been telling them was true. And the first convert was led to the Lord after his work. And so um, we have even more people between the time of this writing and our current day who have given an example of endurance and so I think uh, it's, it's clear that we have that much more of a responsibility to learn from the examples and the witnesses that have come before us. 
And that brings us to our next phrase, surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. This refers to those who went before. For this audience, the specific list of those in chapter 11 that we just read. But for us, not only that, but those who have come since. They all bear witness to our race of faith. We are responsible to learn from their examples. This is purposely meant, the writer here purposely meant to give the image of spectators at a race. Uh, the, today in modern marathons and races, there may be professionals in the audience or the stands or really at any sporting event that requires physical endurance. The players know there could be professionals, uh, retired players in the stands scouting and, and look, watching, watching their performance and endurance to see if they're worthy to go to the next level. And so we should be going through our spiritual endurance, our spiritual life with endurance in the same way, knowing that we have a responsibility to those who came before to follow and learn from their example. But most importantly, God is always watching. Uh, and he is the ultimate uh, one we want to please with our race in life. So uh, when, when you know that in a physical sport, when the players know that there might be pros in the stands watching for talent, uh, they know that these pros have done it before. They know all the moves and you know they're watching and want to show and you want to show them you've learned from their example. Just as spectators at a sport give the participants extra motivation and energy to give it their all, so the lives and examples of those who have gone before us should inspire us to press on in endurance in our lives. Next we see the writer tell us to lay aside every weight and the sin. And I think it's important to realize those are two separate things. Uh, get rid of everything and anything that slows you down in your walk with Christ. Sin is the clear, black and white, biblically wrong behaviors that are outlined in Scripture. Things that we know, without a doubt, displease God, are sin in His eyes, and He does not tolerate in the life of His child. However, this term weight does not bear the same kind of connotation. The term weight here refers to behaviors or habits that may not necessarily be sinful in and of themselves, but still distract and hinder us in our walk with God. And all of us have certain things in our lives that aren't necessarily sinful, but maybe it has too much of a priority over church or your own quiet time with God. Maybe it's uh, something that you look forward to more than you do with your time with God or going to church. Things that can be distracting from our spiritual lives that, again, may not be sinful, but distract us or maybe become a, a stumbling block and distract our brothers and sisters in Christ in their walk with God. We'll see as we go on that the race of faith is not competitive. We are to run together, come alongside each other, and encourage each other in this race of endurance. Uh, a good cross-reference here is Colossians ver uh, chapter 3 verse 8, which says, But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Again, here's a, an example list of some of the things that are um, sin, but sometimes they may not necessarily be sin, but they're things we, can, we need to get, get rid of and make sure are not present in our lives because they can distract us. Because the Bible does say that you can be angry and not sin. Um, there is such thing as righteous anger, righteous wrath. Now, blasphemy and filthy language, I do think, are black and white. So again, that's a rabbit trail that we won't take the time to go down. But um, it's important to first prioritize sin in your life. Make sure that's not slowing you down. But also ask yourself, what are the little things that may not be sinful but are still slowing me down in my walk with God? If you uh, take a look at these pictures I found of runners, um, one was an ancient runner from the Olympics when racing was a big thing back then. Again, this is the type of runner that the writer of Hebrews would be uh, referring to. And you see that they're wearing absolutely, they're wearing only what's necessary um, to run. And in this particular picture, I think it's Spartan trainees, so they have swords and shields and all that too. But um, they put off anything that could become a hindrance or an extra weight in their running. And even today's modern runners, they travel light. 
They wear tight fitting outfits that don't flop in the wind and create drag. They wear only what's necessary. They don't even carry water bottles with them, but I'm sure if you've seen or participated in marathons, there's water stations where you can stop and get a quick drink of water, but you don't have to carry it with you because it's extra weight. And those who are really into any kind of physical endurance sport are very picky about the, the um, clothes they wear, the equipment they use, the type of shoes they get, all to maximize the endurance um, and the effectiveness in their, their race or their sport. And so how much more should we do so spiritually? Uh, today, I, I've heard, I don't know if this is completely true, but I've heard that in both running and swimming, men will even shave the hair off their legs to reduce the drag of the air or the water as they're trying to race. Um, so, and most of us wouldn't even think of that. Like, really? Does it really make that much of a difference? But these runners are timing themselves to the hundredth of a second and everything. They're being extremely particular and careful in maximizing their effectiveness in their race. So let's ask ourselves, are we that particular and careful about our spiritual racing, getting rid of every little thing? Another picture that I found um, was, talks about the phrase, now this phrase is not found in this passage, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with the phrase in the Bible, gird up your loins as a man. We always wonder what that means, and it sounds really weird, sometimes awkward, but this is what it was. Um, on the left, you have the traditional dress of men in Bible times, but when the phrase is used, gird up your loins, you, th there was a certain procedure of wrapping and pulling up and tying uh, their tunic in a way that freed their legs so they could run either to fight or to race or participate in physical demanding activities. And that, that's a perfect picture of what it means to get rid of, fix anything that's going to get in your way, uh, that's going to hinder you from being as effective as possible in the task at hand. Um, so I thought that was an interesting thing, and that was actually something I just randomly happened to come across on Facebook, and I was like, you know what, this fits really well with my message. So um, it's kind of cool what the Lord brings across your path. So all great examples of in our physical life, how we can be very particular about maximizing our efforts, but even in the spiritual life, aren't, we need to be asking ourselves, are we that particular and careful about our spiritual racing, getting rid of even the little things that, again, may not be sin, but are slowing us down. And then finally, in verse 1, we see the phrase, run with endurance. Obviously, as we've been saying, running takes endurance. 1 Corinthians 9, 24-27 I'm going to read that real quick. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 to 27. Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. That means balanced, disciplined. Uh, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, material possessions, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, Thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. And so there we do know this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Corinthians, again using the illustration of a race and training for physical sports. He also refers to boxing um, or their equivalent of boxing, that when you're practicing boxing, you don't just beat in midair usually have a punching bag or something, some sort of equipment to help you as realistically as possible know what to expect and train. Um, and it takes discipline. You have to schedule time to go to a gym. You have to uh, keep track of your stats and drink water and all kinds of things. Again, I'm not much of a person that gets into that, but it takes discipline. And that's what this passage is saying. We need to run with endurance. Per my personal example as, uh, that I use as an introduction, some people are just built better for physical endurance and sports activities. So I, I understand that physically, some people are just built better for it. It comes easier for some people. Uh, for others, it takes a lot more conscious effort and hard work to maintain the necessary level of endurance. And it would have for me if I had been thinking long-term and training even before I left home to prepare for soccer. But I think it is very similar in the Christian life of faith. 
We are all unique in our spiritual strengths and weaknesses. Spiritual endurance may come easier for some believers than it does for others. Uh, I think of the example of, I'm sure you've all seen videos on Facebook, and there's even a big one that went viral at the Olympics a while ago, of runners in a race, and one of them trips and falls, or in the hurdles, like falls over the hurdle. One of the other runners, out of compassion, rather than keeping their place and just saying, ha, you loser, they stop, go back, help that person up, and say, let's cross the finish line together. That is what the Christian life is supposed to be. We're not supposed to be competitive. We're supposed to lift each other up, and if whether you are stronger in the area of spiritual endurance than others, or whether you're just in a, a, a better, easier chapter of life right now, it is our duty to look for those who need endurance spiritually, come alongside them and say, hey, how can I be praying for you? How can I help you? How can I encourage you and give you some endurance in this race? Uh, and, and that's part of running with endurance is helping our brothers and sisters as well. Verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher. He ran the race. Christ has experienced everything we do. He set the ultimate example of how to endure the challenges along the way. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He endured the most brutal and humiliating death known to humanity. All for the joy of giving us redemption, having victory over death, and giving us direct access to God the Father himself. He counted as irrelevant the shame and persecution that he faced in the days leading to and during the cross because he was playing the long game. He was looking ahead to the finish line, to the joy, the prize of making it possible for us to have a personal relationship with him. I can all but guarantee you this morning that most, if not all of us here in this room today, will never even come close to having to endure anything like Christ did on the cross. Yet, he counted it all a joy to do it for you and for me. This verse says he despised the shame. And this word despised here does not mean hated or was angry at or the normal meaning of despise that we think of today. This word carries the meaning of counting is irrelevant. He ignored uh, the shame made no difference to him. He despised it. He ignored, counted as irrelevant, the shame uh, that he faced leading up to the cross. And I'm sure a lot of you remember a sermon I preached around Easter time about the trials of Christ and all the people who brought false accusations and mocking and persecution to his face. And yet through it all, he remained completely silent and only said a couple words that never defended himself. Um, so he was counting as irrelevant the shame that was brought to him. How often do we not even take, how often do we despise the shame that we might face when standing up for Christ or sharing our faith? How, how often do we not even take that first step, have that conversation, or take that opportunity to stand and witness for Christ? The only reason being that we're afraid of being rejected and shamed for our faith. How pathetic is that in light of what Christ did for us? Are we despising the shame as he did as our ultimate example? Are we just counting as irrelevant and it doesn't matter what kind of shame is brought on me for sharing my faith, I'm going to do it because it's what I'm supposed to do. And finally, he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. This was Christ's prize for running the race faithfully with endurance. Christ's reward was being reunited with God the Father, having victory over sin and death, and fulfilling God's redemptive plan that had been established at the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. Our reward will be eternal treasures in heaven, recognition for our faithfulness. There are passages that I didn't take time to uh, share with you this morning, but there are specific passages in the Bible that talk about a robe or a crown, or the, uh, the imperishable treasure that will be put to test by fire when we get to heaven based on the works that we did. Some people will receive special recognition. For example, it's very clear that those who die for, the, for their faith in Christ, the martyrs of history, will receive a special recognition by God in heaven for their faithfulness unto death. So we will receive recognition for our faithfulness and entering into the joy of our master. Philippians 
chapter 3, verse 12, verses 12 through 14 says, again, and again, this is Paul, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind. And if, it, and if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. And so another passage giving the imagery of a race, pressing on toward the goal. When you're running a race, you don't worry about the mistakes you already made or the, the part that's behind you. You're always looking ahead, always looking at the next hill, setting the next goal and, and checkpoint to, to, to reach the finish line ultimately. And that's what we need to be doing as believers. So verses one and two were very chock full of a lot of things. I promise the rest of this will go uh, quicker. Verse three is pretty straightforward and simple. Christ's ultimate example should encourage and lift us up in our motivation to persevere and endure. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your soul. Again, giving Christ as the ultimate example and saying that we're not even going to come close to what he went through, and that should encourage and motivate us to press on. Verse 4, You have not yet resisted to bloodshed, striving against sin. In other words, you haven't even come close to Christ's ordeal of physical persecution. You are only wrestling with spiritual temptation and verbal shaming from your countrymen, which we also know Christ went through and can relate to for us. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with, with the temptation will also make the way of escape, that you may be able to bear it. In other words... Uh, Paul is saying here, and the writer of Hebrews is saying here, you're not alone. Anything you go through, there are other Christians who are going through the same types of things. You're not alone in this race. We're all running together. Take heart from both Christ's example and the fact that others are dealing with the same types of things. Yes, there were many, many believers during this time at which this was written that were being physically harmed, tortured, and even killed for their faith in Christ. But this was not the case with this specific group to which this letter was addressed. Their primary struggle was that of spiritual and emotional persecution from those still in Judaism, pressuring them to recant their faith in Christ and return to the ways of the Jewish law. So that is the first area of endurance, looking to Christ's example in the race of faith. Before we move on, I want to plug in my life verse, Isaiah 40, verses 30 to 31, which says, Even the youth shall faint, and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall rise up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Even young men in their prime have their limit of endurance, as I tragically found out at soccer practice at ABC. But those who wait on the Lord, yes, with this term, wait does mean take time to be still and know that he is God. Wait for him to work in the areas that you're praying for and seeking endurance in. But think of the way we use the word wait today. If someone is waiting on you at a restaurant, does that mean they're just sitting there waiting for you to make your own food and leave? No, they're serving you. They're actively serving you. So I think it's important for us to remember that while you are waiting and being still for God to move, Continue serving faithfully in the areas you know he has given you to do. Be faithful in the church. Participate in the body of Christ. And part of getting endurance is if we are faithful in our parts to, be, uh, to continue serving him in the areas he's given us, that will give us the encouragement and endurance we need to wait for him to work in the larger, more important areas of life that we may be struggling in. Serve him faithfully while you're waiting for the storm to clear. Strength will be renewed. Weariness and fatigue will become obsolete if you are keeping your focus on Christ. What better picture can you find than this of the divine spiritual endurance that God provides for his faithful children? So moving on uh, to the last part of 
Hebrews chapter 12. Verses uh, 5 through 11 give us a picture of enduring the Father's discipline. The Christian race involves endurance not only of persecution from others, but also of discipline from God, our Heavenly Father. Verses 5 through 6. And you have forgotten the exhortation which, speak, which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. This is a direct quote from Proverbs 3 verse 11, which says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. The believer's relationship with God is and should be like that of a child to their loving father. True discipline, not punishment. Punishment is what federal governments and laws uh, give to us. Discipline is the act of love. It is done out of love and for the betterment of the recipient. And that is what God does for us. Verse 7. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? God loves us as sons, and so he will discipline us as sons. Discipline is to be expected. It is a promised part of the Christian walk. Now, in its original context here and to its original audience, this was meant as a rhetorical question, specifically the last part of that verse, For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Unfortunately, today it's not so rhetorical because a good biblical God-intended fatherhood is sorely lacking in our culture and in other places around the world. Um, It's kind of sad that some third world cultures actually have a good family structure for the most part, even if they're not based on scripture. But especially here in our country, good biblical God-intended fatherhood is, is very scarce. As, but in the time that this was written, good structured families were part of the Jewish culture as well. So it was meant as a rhetorical question. Everyone who read this would understand what a good father was supposed to be like and supposed to do, and that discipline was a natural part of growing up and learning from your parents. So we need to realize that there is that difference. It's not as rhetorical today, but I think most of us here today know what that biblical Uh, example is of a good father, and we uh, should see that from God. So, God loves us as sons. Uh, this, This makes us think of Proverbs 13, verse 24, which says, He who spares the rod, uh, which means spares discipline, hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him promptly. So, even Proverbs has lots more verses like that that show that discipline is an important part of raising your children and training them to be good, mature, ethical adults, regardless of whether you're saved or not. And so how much more is it important for us to accept discipline from God? Verse 8, But if you are without chastening, if you're not experiencing discipline, of which all have become partakers, again a reminder that you're not alone, everyone experiences it, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So I think this verse is inciting a question that we need to ask ourselves are you not experiencing God's discipline? Are you then, in that case, are you really God's child? Are you truly walking rightly with him? It's basically promised and guaranteed. Every true child of God will experience discipline from the Lord. And again, we're not alone. We know that everyone goes through this and we should seek to encourage each other. But the term in this verse, illegitimate, implies that maybe you're faking it. If you aren't experiencing true conviction of areas in your walk with God that need to improve or can't remember the last time you felt God was trying to get your attention or deal with you in some area in your life, then maybe you should reevaluate where you truly are in your relationship with him because it's supposed to be a normal, consistent part of our walk with God. Um, Discipline, hardships that he allows for our betterment, again, we never attain full sanctification. We never attain perfect holiness like Christ. No matter where you are in life, there's always room for improvement, always ways that God can show us to grow in our walks with him. So are we truly looking for that? Verse 9, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, 
and we paid them respect, shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of Spirits and live? Again, fairly straightforward verse. If we know we're supposed to respect and submit to our, the authority of our earthly fathers, how much more responsibility do we have to do so with our Heavenly Father? And verse 10 brings out a really interesting point that I've really never noticed in this passage before. Verse 10, For they indeed, earthly fathers, for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Earthly fathers have limited time to train and discipline their children as best they know how. Again, they're humans, they're flawed, they're not going to do it perfectly, and they have a limited amount of time to do it before they have to let their children go, and that child is no longer under their ultimate authority. <clears throat> but the Heavenly Father is always with His children. He is always seeking their betterment and always disciplining them for their entire life. So regardless of whether you're still under your earthly father's authority or not, you are always under the authority of the Heavenly Father. And what an encouragement it is to know that His discipline is perfect. His discipline is never flawed. And He knows exactly what He's doing and is doing it for your best. Um, regardless of how flawed or um, imperfect our earthly fathers are or have been in discipline, God is always perfect, and he can still work that out for good. And finally, verse 11. No, sorry, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. So I think it's a truth that we all can attest to and know for sure. Discipline is never fun in the moment for either party. Excuse me. But if taken well with, and with submission and humility, it brings much growth and reward in the end. So discipline is a necessary part of life, both in our physical families and in our spiritual walk with the Lord. But if we take it well and with the right attitude, both types of discipline will uh, reward us and bring us great uh, and lasting uh, maturity and growth in the end. We don't have time to go into verses 12 uh, through 17, which continues, sort of continues this uh, theme, but I encourage you to go home and read that for yourself this afternoon. Read the rest of the chapter. Uh, see how it applies to this idea of endurance. But 12 through 15 give the basic uh, theme of the Christian race of faith is not competitive. It talks about um, may, uh, strengthening the hands that hang down, um, fixing the limbs that are weak, and make straight paths for those who are running. We're to help each other, keep each other accountable in our race of faith. Come alongside people who are in need of spiritual endurance. Find the things in your life that may be a stumbling block to them and keep their path clear so that they can run well and, and run with endurance the race that is set before them. Let's seek to run together. The life of a believer is like a race. There will be hurdles and there will be hills. There will be distractions and things that we need to always be putting off and pushing aside so we can refocus on the path in front of us and what really matters for eternity. There will always be a need for constant endurance, but we have Jesus as the author and finisher of the race who has experienced every part of the race before us and who is always there to spur us on and give us the endurance we need to keep going. God may discipline us along the way, but we can know for sure that it is only out of love and to make us stronger so we can run better. So, by way of application, how do we find the endurance to keep running? So here's some points to take home. Learn from the lives of those who came before. First of all, dig into the scriptures and read about all the faithful servants of God who persevered in their faith. But you can also find and read biographies of the many missionaries, martyrs, and faithful believers from the more recent past who endured incredible trials for the sake of the gospel. Get rid of anything that is slowing you down. First and foremost, keep your life clear of any besetting sins that hinder your relationship with God, but also ask yourself if there's anything not necessarily sinful, but a distraction to your walk with God, preventing you from getting the time alone with Him that you need or the time in fellowship with the body of Christ. Don't let your fear of rejection hinder you from standing up for the gospel and speaking scriptural truth. Remind yourself constantly of the eternal rewards that are promised at the end of the race. 
Be sure you are always actively serving God and the body of Christ. Even if you are facing a trial of some kind, don't stop serving. You'll be surprised how often helping and serving others actually strengthens and encourages you in the process. It's a God thing. I've experienced it multiple times in my life. The times that I've chosen to remain faithful despite a big hardship I'm going through, if I'm serving others and seeking to encourage others despite my own pain and hurt, God uses that to encourage me. Um, It's incredible what God will do when you stay faithful to him. Accept the discipline of our Heavenly Father. Know that it is always for your good. It will never be more than you can handle. And learn to thank God for the hard times and ask him to show you how he wants you to grow through them. Look for those in need of endurance and, and encourage them. Remember, it's not a competition. We should all be running together and pushing each other on towards the finish line. And finally, look unto Jesus. He is the ultimate source of endurance. So I think uh, this passage of scripture is very um, applicable in our lives today, not only because it's on this side of redemption, but it shows us how important endurance is, and it really is a must. And if you can't remember the last time you were disciplined or had the need for endurance, talk to someone about it, reevaluate your life, uh, and always be looking for those that you can encourage in their race of faith as well. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the truth from your word that we saw today. Thank you for your faithfulness and for the endurance that you do give, um, sometimes from the most unexpected places, Lord. Uh, We thank you for uh, the body of Christ and the unity that you bring and for the opportunity we have to run together. And I pray that you would give us that same mind as, as was in Christ Jesus. May we be unified May we be running together and not seeking to make it a competition. And may we uh, reevaluate each and every one of our own lives to find those things that are weighing us down and those sins which are uh, holding us back.